Section 44 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Scott, Cheltenham, England. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 44. The Death of General Gordon at Khartoum, 1885, by Anonymous. Note. In 1882, there arose in the Sudan, a province of Upper Egypt, one Mohammed Ahmed, who called himself the Mahdi, or Messiah, and invited all true believers to join in a holy war against the Christians. Thousands of wild tribesmen flocked to his banner, and in the following year he annihilated an army of 11,000 English and Egyptians that had attempted to subdue the revolt. Rather than send more soldiers to die in the deserts of the Upper Nile, England decided to abandon the province but first the thousands of whites who had taken refuge in khartoum and other towns of the sudan must be rescued from their perilous position in this crisis the government turned to the one man who could effect the withdrawal if it was still possible and in january eighteen eighty four appointed general gordon to superintend the evacuation of the sudan the editor general gordon arrived at khartoum on february eighteen and spent his time between that date and the investment on march twelve in sending down women and children two thousand of whom were sent safely through to egypt in addition to six hundred soldiers it was stated by sir evelyn baring english consul-general in egypt that there were fifteen thousand persons in khartoum who ought to be brought back to egypt europeans civil servants widows and orphans and a garrison of one thousand men one-third of whom were disaffected to get these people out of khartoum was general gordon's first duty and the first condition of evacuation was the establishment of a stable government in the sudan the only man who could establish that government was zebair gordon demanded zebair with ever-increasing emphasis and his request was decisively refused he had then two alternatives either to surrender absolutely to the mahdi or to hold on to khartoum at all hazards while gordon was strengthening his position the mahdi settled the question by suddenly assuming the offensive the first step in this memorable siege was the daring march of four thousand arabs to the nile by which on march twelve they cut off the eight hundred men at halfaya a village to the north of khartoum from the city a steamer was sent down to reconnoitre and the moment she reached the front of the arab position a volley was fired into her wounding an officer and a soldier the steamer returned the fire killing five thus hostilities began our only justification for assuming the offensive wrote general gordon on march thirteen is the extrication of the halfaya garrison the arabs however did not give him the chance they cut off three companies of his troops who had gone out to cut wood capturing eight of their boats and killing or dispersing one hundred to one hundred and fifty men they entrenched themselves along the nile and kept up a heavy rifle fire retreat for the garrison was obviously impossible when the arab force covered the river the only line of retreat with their fire twelve hundred men were put on board two grain barges towed by three steamers defended with boiler plates and carrying mountain guns protected by wooden mantlets and with the loss of only two killed they succeeded in extricating the five hundred men left of the garrison of halfaya and capturing seventy camels and eighteen horses with which they returned to khartoum the arabs however held halfaya and on march sixteen gordon tried to drive them away advancing from a stockaded position covering the north front of the town two thousand troops advanced across the open in square supported by the fire of the guns of two steamers the arabs were retreating when hassan and said pashas gordon's black generals rode into the wood and called back the enemy the egyptians betrayed by their officers broke and fled after firing a single volley 
and were pursued to within a mile of the stockade abandoning two mountain guns with their ammunition sixty horsemen defeated two thousand men and leaving two hundred of their number on the field after this affair he was convinced that he could not take the offensive but must remain quiet at khartoum and wait till the nile rose six days later the black pashas were tried by court-martial found guilty and shot a very determined attack upon one of the steamers coming up from berber at the salboka pass was beaten off with great slaughter gordon's men firing no fewer than fifteen thousand rounds of remington ammunition meanwhile his efforts to negotiate with the mahdi failed i will make you sultan of kordofan he had said on arrival to the mahdi i am the mahdi replied mahomet achmet by emissaries who were exceedingly cheeky keeping their hands upon their swords and laying a filthy patched dervish's coat before him will you become a mussulman gordon flung the bundle across the room cancelled the mahdi's sultanship and the war was renewed from that day to the day of the betrayal no day passed without bullets dropping into khartoum gordon now set to work in earnest to place khartoum in a defensible position ten thousand of the mahdi's sympathizers left khartoum and joined the enemy the steamers kept up a skirmishing fight on both niles all the houses on the north side of khartoum were loopholed a sixteen-pounder krupp was mounted on a barge and wire was stretched across the front of the stockade the houses on the northern bank of the blue nile were fortified and garrisoned by bashi bazooks omdurman was held and fortified on the west and buri on the east on march twenty five gordon had to disarm and disband two hundred and fifty bashi bazooks who refused to occupy stockaded houses in a village on the south bank of the blue nile the rebels advanced on haji ali a village to the north of the nile and fired into the palace they were shelled out of their position but constantly returned to harass the garrison they seemed to gordon more ragtag and bobtail but he dared not go out to meet them for fear of the town five hundred brave men could have cleared out the lot but he had not a hundred the fighting was confined to artillery fire on one side and desultory rifle shooting on the other this went on till the end of march the arabs clustered more closely round the town on april nineteen gordon telegraphed that he had provisions for five months and if he only had two thousand to three thousand turkish troops he could soon settle the rebels unfortunately he received not one fighting man shendi fell into the hands of the mahdi berber followed and then for months no word whatever reached this country from khartoum on september twenty nine mr powers telegram dated july thirty one was received by the times from that we gathered a tolerably clear notion of the way in which the war went on anything more utterly absurd than the accusation that gordon forced fighting on the mahdi cannot be conceived he acted uniformly on the defensive merely trying to clear his road of an attacking force and failing because he had no fighting men to take the offensive he found himself in a trap out of which he could not cut his way if he had possessed a single regiment the front of khartoum might have been cleared with ease but his impotence encouraged the arabs and they clustered round in ever-increasing numbers until at last they crushed his resistance after the middle of april the rebels began to attack the palace in force having apparently established themselves on the north bank the loss of life was chiefly occasioned by the explosion of mines devised by general gordon and so placed as to explode when trodden on by the enemy of all his expedients these mines were the most successful and the least open to any accusation of offensive operations the arabs closed in all round towards the end of april and general gordon surrounded himself with a formidable triple barrier of land torpedoes over which wire entanglement and a formidable chevaux de frise enabled the garrison to feel somewhat secure on april twenty seven valet bay surrendered at messalima a disaster by which general gordon lost one steamer seventy shiploads of provisions and two thousand rifles general gordon was now entirely cut off from the outside world 
and compelled to rely entirely upon his own resources he sent out negroes to entice the slaves of the arabs to come over promising them freedom and rations this he thought would frighten the arabs more than bullets on april twenty sixth he made his first issue of paper money to the extent of two thousand five hundred pounds redeemable in six months by july thirty it had risen to twenty six thousand pounds besides the fifty thousand pounds borrowed from merchants on the same day he struck decorations for the defence of khartoum for officers in silver silver gilt and pewter for the private soldiers these medals bear a crescent and a star with words from the koran and the date with an inscription siege of khartoum and a hand grenade in the centre school children and women he wrote also received medals consequently i am very popular with the black ladies of khartoum the repeated attacks of the mahdi's forces on khartoum cost the arabs many lives on may twenty five colonel stuart was slightly wounded in the arm when working a mitrailleuse near the palace all through may and june his steamers made foraging expeditions up and down the nile shelling the rebels when they showed in force and bringing back much cattle to the city on midsummer day mr cousy formerly gordon's agent at berber but now a prisoner of the mahdi's was sent to the wells to announce the capture of berber it was sad news for the three englishmen alone in the midst of a hostile soudan undaunted they continued to stand at bay rejoicing greatly that in one sati bay they had at least a brave and capable officer sati had charge of the steamers and for two months he had uninterrupted success in spite of the twisted telegraph wires which the rebels stretched across the river unfortunately on july ten sati with colonel stuart and two hundred men after burning kalaka and three villages attacked gatarnulb eight arab horsemen rode at the two hundred egyptians the two hundred fled at once not caring to fire their remingtons and poor sati was killed colonel stuart narrowly escaped a similar fate after july thirty one there is a sudden cessation of regular communications powers journal breaks off then and we are left to more or less meagre references in gordon's dispatches on august twenty three he sent a characteristic message in which he announces that the nile having risen he has sent colonel stuart mr power and the french consul to take berber occupy it for fifteen days burn it and then return to khartoum all the late messages from gordon except a long dispatch of november four which has never been published were written on tissue paper no bigger than a postage stamp and either concealed in a quill thrust into the hair or sewn in the waistband of the natives employed gordon seems to have been the most active in august and september when the nile was high he had eight thousand men at khartoum and sanaa he sent colonel stuart and the troops with the steamers to recapture berber a steamer which bore a rough effigy of gordon at the prow was said to be particularly dreaded by the rebels on august twenty six he reported that he had provisions for five months but in the forays made by his steamer on the southern niles he enormously replenished his stores on one of these raids he took with him six thousand men in thirty-four boats towed by nine steamers after his defeat before omdurman the mahdi is said to have made a very remarkable prophecy he retired into a cave for three days and on his return he told his followers that allah had revealed that for sixty days there would be a rest and after that blood would flow like water the mahdi was right almost exactly sixty days after that prophecy there was fought the battle of abu Kli. stuart had by this time been treacherously killed on his way down from berber to dongola gordon was all alone the old men and women who had friends in the neighbouring villages left the town the uninhabited part was destroyed the remainder was enclosed by a wall in the centre of khartoum he had built himself a tower from the roof of which he kept a sharp lookout with his field glasses in the daytime at night he went the rounds of the fortifications cheering his men and keeping them on the alert against attacks treachery was always his greatest dread many of the townsfolk sympathized with the mahdi he could not depend on all his troops and he could only rely on one of his pashas mehmet ali 
he rejoiced exceedingly in the news of the approach of the british relieving force he illuminated khartoum and fired salutes in honour of the news and he doubled his exertions to fill his granaries with grain on december fourteen a letter was received by one of his friends in cairo from general gordon saying farewell you will never hear from me again i fear that there will be treachery in the garrison and all will be over by christmas it was this melancholy warning that led lord wolseley to order the dash across the desert on december sixteen came news that the mahdi had again failed in his attack on omdurman gordon had blown up the fort which he had built over against the town and inflicted great loss on his assailants who however invested the city closely on all sides the mahdi had returned to omdurman where he had concentrated his troops thence he sent fourteen thousand men to berber to recruit the forces of osman digma and it was these men probably that fought the english relief army at abu Kli. after this nothing was heard beyond the rumour that omdurman was captured and two brief messages from gordon sent probably to hoodwink the enemy by whom most of his letters were captured the first which arrived january one was as follows khartoum all right c g gordon december fourteen eighteen eighty four the second was brought by the steamers which met general stuart at mentemna on january twenty first khartoum all right could hold out for years c g gordon december twenty nine on january twenty six faraz pasha opened the gates of the city to the enemy and one of the most famous sieges in the world's history came to a close it had lasted from march twelve to january twenty six exactly three hundred and twenty days note when gordon awoke to find that through the treachery of his egyptian lieutenant khartoum was in the hands of the mahdi he set out with a few followers for the austrian consulate recognized by a party of rebels he was shot dead on the street and his head carried through the town at the end of a pike amid the wild rejoicings of the mahdi's followers two days later the english army of relief reached khartoum the mahdi and his followers ruled the soudan until eighteen ninety eight when their army was destroyed at omdurman by an english force under general kitchener the editor End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scotty. The World Story, Volume 3. Egypt, Africa, and Arabia edited by eva march tappan section forty five up the cataracts of the nile eighteen seventy five by charles dudley warner at twelve o'clock we are ready to push off the wind is strong from the north the cataract men swarm on board two or three sheiks and thirty or forty men they take command and possession of the vessel and our rays and crew give way we have carefully closed the windows and blinds of our boat for the cataract men are reputed to have long arms and fingers that crook easily the nubians run about like cats four are at the helm some are at the bow all are talking and giving orders there is an indescribable bustle and whirl as our boat is shoved off from the sand with the chorus of ha yalasa ha yalasa and takes the current the great sail shaped like a bird's wing and a hundred feet long is shaken out forward and we pass swiftly on our way between the granite walls the excited hawaji are on deck feeling to their finger ends the thrill of expectancy the first thing the nubians want is something to eat a chronic complaint here in this land of romance squatting in circles all over the boat they dip their hands into the bowls of softened bread cramming the food down their throats and swallow all the coffee that can be made for them with the gusto and appetite of simple men who have a stomach and no conscience while the nubians are chattering and eating we are gliding up the swift stream the granite rocks opening the passage for us but at the end of it our way seems to be barred the only visible opening is on the extreme left 
where a small stream struggles through the boulders while we are wondering if that can be our course the helm is suddenly put hard about and we are then shoot to the right finding our way amid whirlpools and boulders of granite past the head of elephantine island and before we have recovered from this surprise we turn sharply to the left into a narrow passage and the cataract is before us it is not at all what we have expected in appearance this is a cataract without any falls and scarcely any rapids a person brought up on niagara or montmorency feels himself trifled with here the fisherman in the mountain streams of america has come upon many a scene that resembles this a river bed strewn with boulders only this is on a grand scale we have been led to expect at least high precipices walls of lofty rock between which we should sail in the midst of raging rapids and falls and that there would be hundreds of savages on the rocks above dragging our boat with cables and occasionally plunging into the torrent in order to carry a lifeline to the top of some sea-girt rock all of this we did not see but yet we have more respect for the cataract before we get through it than when it first came in sight what we see immediately before us is a basin it may be a quarter of a mile it may be half a mile broad and two miles long a wild expanse of broken granite rocks and boulders strewn haphazard some of them showing the red of the cyanite and others black and polished and shining in the sun a field of rocks none of them high of fantastic shapes and through this field the river breaks in a hundred twisting passages and chutes all apparently small but the water in them is foaming and leaping and flashing white and the air begins to be pervaded by the multitudinous roar of rapids on the east the side of the land passage between aswan and phile were high and jagged rocks in odd forms now and then a palm tree and here and there a mud village on the west the basin of the cataract is hemmed in by the desert hills and the yellow libyan sand drifts over them in shining waves and rifts which in some lights have the almost maroon color that we see in jerome's pictures to the south is an impassable barrier of granite and sand mountains of them beyond the glistening fields of rocks and water through which we are to find our way the difficulty of this navigation is not one cataract to be overcome by one heroic effort but a hundred little cataracts or swift torturous sluiceways which are much more formidable when we get into them than they are when seen at a distance the dahabias which attempt to wind through them are in constant danger of having holes knocked in their hulls by the rocks the wind is strong and we are sailing swiftly on it is impossible to tell which one of the half dozen equally uninviting channels we are to take we guess and of course point out the wrong one we approach with sails still set a narrow passage through which the water pours in what is a very respectable torrent but it is not a straight passage it has a bend in it if we get through it we must make a sharp turn to the left or run upon a ridge of rocks and even then we shall be in a boiling surge and if we fail to make head against the current we shall go whirling down the cauldron bumping on the rocks not a pleasant thing for a dahabia one hundred and twenty feet long with a cabin in it as large as a hotel the passage of a boat this size is evidently an event of some interest to the cataract people for we see groups of them watching us from the rocks and following along the shore and we think that seeing our boat go up from the shore might be the best way of seeing it we draw slowly in the boat trembling at the entrance of the swift water it enters nosing the current feeling the tug of the sail and hesitates oh for a strong puff of wind there are five watchful men at the helm there is a moment's silence and the boat still hesitates at this critical instant while we are holding our breath a naked man whose name i am sorry i cannot give to an admiring american public appears on the bow with a rope in his teeth he plunges in and makes for the nearest rock he swims hand over hand swinging his arms from the shoulders out of water and striking them forward splashing along like a side wheeler the common way of swimming in the heavy water of the nile two other black figures follow him and the rope is made fast to the point of the rock we have something to hold us against the stream 
and now a terrible tumult arises on board the boat which is seen to be covered with men one gang is hauling on the rope to draw the great sail close to its work another gang is hauling on the rope attached to the rock and both are singing that wild chanting chorus without which no egyptian sailors pull an ounce or lift a pound the men who are not pulling are shouting and giving orders the sheiks on the upper deck where we sit with american serenity exaggerated amid the babel are jumping up and down in a frenzy of excitement screaming and gesticulating we hold our own we gain a little we pull forward where the danger of a smash against the rocks is increased more men appear on the rocks whom we take to be spectators of our passage no they lay hold of the rope with the additional help we still tremble in the jaws of the pass i walk aft and the stern is almost upon the rocks it grazes them but in the nick of time the bow swings round we turn short off into an eddy the great wing of a sail is let go and our cat-like sailors are aloft crawling along the slender yard which is a hundred feet in length and furling the tugging canvas we breathe more freely for the first danger is over the first gate is passed in this lull there is a confab with the sheiks we are at the island of sahail and have accomplished what is usually the first day's journey of boats it would be in harmony with the oriental habit to stop here for the remainder of the day and the night but our dragoman has in mind to accomplish if not the impossible what is synonymous with it in the east the unusual the result of the inflammatory stump speeches on both sides is that two or three gold pieces are passed into the pliant hand of the head sheik and he sends for another sheik and more men for some time we have been attended by the increasing procession of men and boys on shore they cheered us as we passed the first rapid they came out from the villages from the crevices of the rocks their blue and white gowns flowing in the wind and making a sort of holiday of our passage less conspicuous at first are those without gowns they are hardly distinguishable from the black rocks amid which they move as we lie here with the rising roar of the rapids in our ears we can see no further opening for our passage but we are preparing to go on ropes are carried out forward over the rocks more men appear to aid us we said there were fifty we count seventy we count eighty there are at least ninety they come up by a sort of magic from whence are they these black forms they seem to grow out of the rocks at the wave of the sheik's hand they are of the same color shining men of granite the swimmers and the divers are simply smooth statues hewn out of the cyanide or the basalt they are not unbaked clay like the rest of us one expects to see them disappear like stones when they jump into the water the mode of our navigation is to draw the boat along hugged close to the shore rocks so closely that the current cannot get full hold of it and thus to work it round the bends we are crawling along slowly in this manner clinging to the rocks when unexpectedly a passage opens to the left the water before us runs like a mill race if we enter it nothing would seem to be able to hold the boat from dashing down amidst the breakers but the bow is hardly let to feel the current before it is pulled short round and we are swinging in the swift stream before we know it we are in the anxiety of another tug suppose the rope should break in an instant the black swimmers are overboard striking out for the rocks two ropes are sent out and secured and the gangs hauling on them we are working inch by inch through everybody on board trembling with excitement we look at our watches it seems only fifteen minutes since we left aswan it's an hour and a quarter do we gain in the chute it's difficult to say the boat hangs back and strains at the cables but just as we are in the pinch of doubt the big sail unfurls its wing with exciting suddenness a strong gust catches it we feel the lift and creep upward amid an infernal din of singing and shouting and calling on the prophet from the gangs who haul in the sail rope who tug at the cables attached to the rocks who are pulling at the hawsers on the shore we forge ahead and are about to dash into a boiling cauldron before us from which there appears to be no escape 
when a skilful turn of the great creaking helm once more throws us to the left and we are again in an eddy with the stream whirling by us and the sail is let go and is furled the place where we lie is barely long enough to admit our boat its stern just clears the rocks its bow is aground on hard sand the number of men and boys on the rocks has increased it is over one hundred it is one hundred and thirty on a recount it is one hundred and fifty an anchor is now carried out to hold us in position when we make a new start more ropes are taken to the shore two hitched to the bow and one to the stern straight before us is a narrow passage through which the water comes in foaming ridges with extraordinary rapidity it seems to be our way but of course it is not we are to turn the corner sharply before reaching it what will happen then we shall see there is a slight lull in the excitement while the extra hawsers are got out and preparations are made for the next struggle the sheiks light their long pipes and squatting on deck gravely wait the men who have tobacco roll up cigarettes and smoke them the swimmers come on board for reinforcement the poor fellows are shivering as if they had an ague fit the nile may be friendly though it does not offer a warm bath at this time of the year but when they come out of it naked on the rocks the cold north wind sets their white teeth chattering the dragoman brings out a bottle of brandy it's none of your ordinary brandy but must have cost over a dollar a gallon and would burn a hole in a new piece of cotton cloth he pours out a tumblerful of it and offers it to one of the granite men the granite man pours it down his throat in one flow without moving an eye winker and holds the glass out for another his throat must be lined with zinc a second tumblerful follows the first it's like pouring liquor into a brazen image i said there was a lull but this is only in contrast to the preceding fury there is still noise enough over and above the roar of the waters in the preparations going forward the din of a hundred people screaming together each one giving orders and elaborating his opinion by a rhetorical use of his hands the waiting crowd scattered over the rocks disposes itself picturesquely as an arab crowd always does and probably cannot help doing in its blue and white gowns and white turbans in the midst of these preparations and unmindful of any excitement or confusion a sheik standing upon a little square of sand amid the rocks and so close to the deck of the boat that we can hear his allahu akbar god is most great begins his kneelings and prostrations towards mecca and continues at his prayers as undisturbed and as unregarded as if he were in a mosque and wholly oblivious of the babel around him so common has religion become in this land of its origin here is a half-clad sheik of the desert stopping in the midst of his contract to take the hawaji up the cataract to raise his forefinger and say i testify that there is no deity but god and i testify that mohammed is his servant and his apostle judging by the eye the double turn we have next to make is too short to admit our long hull it does not seem possible that we can squeeze through but we try we first swing out and take the current as if we were going straight up the rapids we are held by two ropes from the stern while by four ropes from the bow three on the left shore and one on the islet to the right the cataract people are tugging to draw us up as we watch almost breathless the strain on the ropes look there is a man in the tumultuous rapid before us swiftly coming down as if to his destruction another one follows and then another till there are half dozen men and boys in this jeopardy the situation of certain death to anybody not made of cork and the singular thing about it is that the men are seated upright sliding down the shining water like a boy who has no respect for his trousers down a snowbank as they dash past us we see that each man is seated on a round log about five feet long some of them sit upright with their legs on the log displaying the soles of their feet keeping the equilibrium with their hands these are smooth slimy logs that a white man would find it difficult to sit on if they were on shore and in this water they would turn with him only once the log would go one way and the man another but these fellows are in no fear of the rocks below 
they easily guide their barks out of the rushing floods through the whirlpools and eddies into the slack shore water in the rear of the boat and stand up like men and demand backsheesh these logs are popular ferry boats in the upper nile i have seen a woman crossing the river on one her clothes in a basket and the basket on her head and the nile is nowhere an easy stream to swim far ahead of us the cataract people are seen in lines and groups half hidden by the rocks pulling and stumbling along black figures are scattered along lifting the ropes over the jagged stones and freeing them so that we shall not be drawn back as we slowly advance and severe as their toil is it is not enough to keep them warm when the chilly wind strikes them they get bruised on the rocks also and have time to show us their barked shins and request bakshish an egyptian is never too busy or too much in peril to forget to prefer that request at the sight of a traveller when we turn into the double twist i spoke of above the bow goes sideways upon a rock and the stern is not yet free the punt poles are brought into requisition half the men are in the water there is poling and pushing and grunting heaving and ya mohammed ya mohammed with all which noise and outlay of brute strength the boat moves a little on and still is held close in hand the current runs very swiftly we have to turn almost by a right angle to the left and then by the same angle to the right and the question is whether the boat is not too long to turn in the space we just scrape along the rocks the current growing every moment stronger and at length get far enough to let the stern swing i run back to see if it will go free it is a close fit the stern is clear but if our boat had been four or five feet longer her voyage would have ended then and there there is now before us a straight pull up the swiftest and narrowest rapid we have thus far encountered our sandal the rowboat belonging to the dahabiyah that becomes a felucca when a mast is stepped into it which has accompanied us fitfully during the passage appearing here and there tossing about amid the rocks and aiding occasionally in the transport of ropes and men to one rock and another now turns away to seek a less difficult passage the rocks all about us are low from three feet to ten feet high we have one rope out ahead fastened to a rock upon which a gang of men pulling there is a row of men in the water under the left side of the boat heaving at her with their broad backs to prevent her smashing on the rocks but our main dragging force is the two long lines of men attached to the ropes on the left shore they stretch out ahead of us so far that it needs an opera glass to discover whether the leaders are pulling or only soldiering these two long struggling lines are led and directed by a new figure who appears upon this operatic scene it is a comical sheik who stands upon a high rock at one side and lines out the catch lines of a working refrain while the gangs howl and haul in surging chorus nothing could be wilder or more ludicrous in the midst of this roar of rapids and strain of cordage the sheik holds a long staff which he swings like the baton of the leader of an orchestra quite unconscious of the odd figure he cuts against the blue sky he grows more and more excited he swings his arms he shrieks but always in tune and in time with the hauling and the wilder chorus of the cataract men he lifts up his right leg he lifts up his left leg he is in the very ecstasy of the musical conductor displaying his white teeth and raising first one leg and then the other in a delirious swinging motion all the more picturesque on account of his flowing blue robe and his loose white cotton drawers he lifts his leg with a gigantic pull which is enough in itself to draw the boat onward and every time he lifts it the boat gains on the current surely such an orchestra and such a leader was never seen before for the orchestra is scattered over half an acre of ground swaying and pulling and singing in rhythmic show and there is a high wind and a blue sky and rocks and foaming torrents and an african village with palms in the background amid the debris of the great convulsion of nature which has resulted in this chaos slowly we creep up against the stiff boiling stream 
the good moslems on deck muttering prayers and telling their beads and finally make the turn and pass the worst eddies and as we swing around into an oxbow channel to the right the big sail is again let out and hauled in and with cheers we float on some rods and come into a quiet shelter a stage beyond the journey usually made the first day it is now three o'clock we have come to the real cataract to the stiffest pool and the most dangerous passage the small freight dahabia obstructs the way and while this is being hauled ahead we prepare for the final struggle the chief cataract is called bab gate abu rabia from one of muhammad ali's captains who some years ago vowed that he would take his dahabia up it with his own crew and without aid from the cataract people he lost his boat it is also sometimes called bob inglese from a young englishman named cave who attempted to swim down it early one morning in imitation of the nubian swimmers and was drawn into the whirlpools and not found for days after for this last struggle in addition to the other ropes an enormous cable is bent on not tied to the bow but twisted round the cross beams of the forward deck and carried out over the rocks from the shelter where we lie we are to push out and take the current at a sharp angle the water of this main cataract sucks down from both sides above through a channel perhaps one hundred feet wide very rapid and with considerable fall and with such force as to raise a ridge in the middle to pull up this hill of water is the tug if the ropes let go we shall be dashed into a hundred pieces on the rocks below and be swallowed in the whirlpools it would not be a sufficient compensation for this fate to have this rapid hereafter take our name the preparations are leisurely made the lines are laid along the rocks and the men are distributed the fastenings are carefully examined then we begin to move there are now four conductors of this gigantic orchestra the employment of which as a musical novelty i respectfully recommend to the next boston jubilee each posted on a high rock and waving a stick with a white rag tied to it it is now four o'clock an hour has been consumed in raising the curtain for our last act we are now carefully under way along the rocks which are almost within reach held tight by the side ropes but pushed off and slowly urged along by a line of half-naked fellows under the left side whose backs are against the boat and whose feet walk along the perpendicular ledge it would take only a sag of the boat apparently to crush them it does not need our eyes to tell us when the bow of the boat noses the swift water our sandal meantime has carried a line to a rock on the opposite side of the channel and our sailors haul on this and draw us ahead but we are held firmly by the shore lines the boat is never suffered as i said to get an inch the advantage but is always held tight in hand as we appear at the foot of the rapid men come riding down it on logs as before a sort of horseback feed in the boiling water steering themselves round the eddies and landing below us one of them swims round to the rock where the line is tied and looses it as we pass another sitting on the slippery stick and showing the white soles of his black feet paddles himself about amid the whirling pools we move so slowly that we have time to enjoy all these details to admire the deep yellow of the libyan sand drifted over the rocks at the right and to cheer a sandal bearing the american flag which is at this moment shooting the rapids in another channel beyond us tossed about like a cork we see the meteor flag flashing out we lose it behind the rocks and catch it again appearing below o oh, star spang but our own orchestra is in full swing again the comical sheik begins to swing his arms and his stick back and forth in an increasing measure until his whole body is drawn into the vortex of his enthusiasm and one leg after the other by a sort of rhythmic hitch goes up displaying the white and baggy cotton drawers the other three conductors join in and a deafening chorus from two hundred men goes up along the ropes while we creep slowly or amid the suppressed excitement of those on board who anxiously watch the straining cables and with a running fire of bakshish bakshish from the boys on the rocks close at hand the cable holds the boat nags and jerks at it in vain 
through all the roar and rush we go in lifted i think perceptibly every time the sheik lifts his legs at the right moment the sail is again shaken down and the boat at once feels it it is worth five hundred men the rope slackened we are going by the wind against the current haste is made to unbend the cable line after line is let go until we are held by one alone the crowd thins out dropping away with no warning and before we know that the play is played out the cataract people have lost all interest in it and are scattering over the black rocks to their homes a few stop to cheer the chief conductor is last seen on a rock swinging the white rag hurrahing and salaaming and grinning exultation the last line is cast off and we round the point and come into smooth but swift water and glide into a calm mind the noise the struggle the tense strain the uproar of men and waves for four hours are all behind and hours of keener excitement and enjoyment we have rarely known at twelve twenty we left aswan at four forty five we swung around the rocky bend above the last and greatest rapid i write these figures for they will be not without a melancholy interest to those who have spent two or three days or a week in making this passage. End of section forty five. This recording is in the public domain. Section forty six of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org. Northern Africa, Part One. Legendary History and the Story of Carthage. Historical Note according to legend one pygmalion of tyre murdered the husband of his sister dido by this crime he had expected to become master of the vast wealth of his brother-in-law but dido seizing her husband's treasure fled with many followers to northern africa near where tunis now stands she asked the natives for as much land as a bursa that is a bull's hide would enclose they agreed and the wily phoenicians cut the hide into strips and upon the ground which these could be stretched to enclose they built a citadel and named it bursa in memory of the act this was the beginning of carthage which became the greatest city of northern africa it is thought to have been founded about eight twenty six b c while the city was yet young aeneas and his companions refugees from the downfall of troy landed on the carthaginian coast and were received by queen dito with all honor when after enjoying her hospitality for many months aeneas refused her hand and sailed away in search of the hesperian kingdom which had been promised him by the gods dido threw herself upon a funeral pile and there met her death such is the early story of carthage a mingling of fact and legend the wonderful growth of the city is not legend however for it not only extended its dominions in northern africa but also won holdings in sicily sardinia corsica and spain its greatness aroused the jealousy of rome and in 146 b c after three bitter wars it was leveled with the ground julius caesar planned to restore it and this plan was carried out by augustus in 29 b c the new city became large and prosperous in 439 a d it was made the capital of the kingdom of the vandals but was conquered by belisarius a century later in 647 the arabs destroyed it and now only a few ruins remain end of section 46 this recording is in the public domain section 47 of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox.org by our mapstone Ulysses in the Land of the Lotus Eaters, Tripoli, by Homer. Thence for nine days I drifted before the deadly winds along the swarming sea, but on the tenth we touched the land of lotus eaters, men who made food of flowers. So here we went ashore and drew us water, and soon by the swift ships my men prepared their dinner then after we had tasted food and drink i sent some sailors forth 
to go and learn what men who live by bread dwelt in this land selecting two and joining with them a herald as a third these straightway went and mingled with the lotus eaters and yet the lotus eaters had no thought of harm against our men indeed they gave them lotus to taste but whosoever of them ate the lotus's honeyed fruits wished to bring tidings back no more and never to leave the place but with the lotus eaters there desired to stay to feed on lotus and forget his going home these men i brought back weeping to the ships by force and dragging them under the benches of our hollow ships i bound them fast and bade my other trusty men to hasten and embark on the swift ships that none of them might eat the lotus and forget his going home quickly they came aboard took places at the pins and sitting in order smote the flaming water with their oars end of section 47 this recording is in the public domain section 48 of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dave lance the world story volume 3 egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan Section 48. Aeneas at Carthage by Virgil. After Troy and Asia Minor had been overthrown by the Greeks, Aeneas, a Trojan prince, led a company of refugees over the Mediterranean Sea in search of a new home. They were driven by a storm upon the shores of northern Africa, where Queen Dido reigned. She had fled from Tyre and from a wicked brother who had slain her husband and she was now making for herself a new kingdom. Aeneas, by favor of his goddess mother Venus, was hidden, together with his companion Achates, in a mist which veiled them from the eyes of others. So says the ancient story. The Editor But therewithal they speed their way, as led the road along, and now they scale a spreading hill that o'er the town is hung, and looking downward thereupon, hath all the burg in face. Aeneas marvels how that world was once a peasant's place. He marvels at the gates, the roar and rattle of the waves. Hot heart, the Tyrians speed the work, and some the ramparts raise. Some pile the burg high, some with hand roll stones up o'er the ground. Some choose a place for dwelling-house, and draw a trench around. Some choose the laws and lords of doom, the holy senate choose. These thereaway the havens dig, and deep adown sink those the founding of the theatre walls, or cleave the living stone in pillars huge, one day to show full fair the scene upon. As in new summer, neath the sun, the bees are wont to speed their labour in the flowery fields, wherever now they lead the well-grown offspring of their race, or when the cells they store with flowing honey, till fulfilled of sweets they hold no more, or take the loads of newcomers, or, as a watch well set, drive off the lazy herd of drones that they no dwelling get, well speeds the work, and timey sweet the honey's odor is. Well favored of the fates are ye, whose walls arise in bliss, Aeneas cries, a-looking o'er the housetop spread below, and wonderful to tell in tale, hedged round with cloud doth go. The two men come to a grove within the town, and behold, on the walls of a temple standing in the grove are representations of the Trojan battles and the heroic deeds of Trojan heroes. The Editor But while Aeneas, Darden Lord, beholds the marvels there, and all amazed, stands moving naught with eyes in one set stare, lo, cometh Dido, very queen of fairest fashion wrought, by youths close thronging all about unto the temple brought. Yea, e'en as on Eurotus' rim, or Synthus' ridges high, Diana leadeth dance about. A thousandfold an eye the following oreads gather round, with shoulder quiver hung, 
she overbears the goddesses her swift feet fair among and great latona's silent breast the joys of godhead touch lo such was dido joyously she bore herself in such amidst them eager for the work and ordered rule to come then through the goddess's door she passed and midmost neat the dome high raised upon a throne she sat with weapons hedged about and doomed and fashioned laws for men and fairly sifted out and dealt their share of toil to them or drew the lot as happed there suddenly aeneas sees amidst the concourse wrapped antheus sir Justus, and the strong cloanthus draw an eye and other teucrians whom the whirl wild black all utterly had scattered into other lands afar across the sea amazed he stood nor stricken was achates less than he by joy by fear they hungered sore hand unto hand to set but doubts of dealings that might be stirred in their hearts as yet so lurking cloaked in hollow cloud they note what things betide their fellows there and on what shore the ships they manned may bide and whence they come for chosen out of all the ships they bear bidding of peace and crying out thus templeward they fare but now when they were entered in and gained the grace of speech from placid heart Ileonus the elder gan beseech o queen to whom hath jove here given a city new to raise and with thy justice to draw rein on men of wilful ways we wretched trojans tossed about by winds o'er every main pray thee forbid it from our ships the dreadful fiery bane spare pious folk and look on us with favouring kindly eyes we are not come with sword to waste the libyan families nor drive adown unto the strand the plunder of the strong no such high hearts such might of mind to vanquished folk belong there is a place hesperia called of greeks in days that are an ancient land a fruitful soil a mighty land in war enotrian folk first tilled the land whose sons as rumours run now call it naught but italy from him who led them on and thitherward our course was turned when sudden stormy tumbling seas orion rose on us and wholly scattered us abroad with fierce blasts from the south drave us wind-swept by shallows blind to straits with wayless mouth but to thy shores we few have swum and so betake us here what men among men are ye then what country soil may bear such savage ways ye grudge us then the welcome of your sand and fall to arms and gainsay us a tide-washed strip of strand but if men-folk and wars of men ye wholly set at naught yet deem the gods bear memory still of good and evil wrought aeneas was the king of us no juster was there one no better lover of the gods none more in battle shone and if the fates have saved that man if earthly air he drink nor neath the cruel deadly shades his fallen body shrink naught need we fear nor ye repent to strive in kindly deed with us we have in sicily fair cities to our need and fields we have acestes high of trojan blood is come now suffer us our shattered ships in haven to bring home to cut us timber in thy woods and shave us oars anew and if the italian crews to us if friends and king are due to italy and latium then full merry when we on but if dear father of our folk hope of thy health be gone and thee the libyan waters have nor hope eulus give then the sicanian shores at least and seats wherein to live whence hither came we and the king acestes let us seek so spake he and the others made as they the same would speak the darden folk with murmuring mouth but dido with her head hung down in few words answer gave let fear fall from you teucrian men and set your cares aside hard fortune yet constraineth me in this my realm untried to hold such heed with guard to watch my marches up and down who knoweth not aeneas folk who knoweth not troy town the valour and the men and all the flame of such a war nay surely not so dull as this the souls within us are nor turns the sun from tyrian town so far off yoking steed 
so whether ye Hesperia great and saturn's acres need or rather unto eric's turn and king acestes shore safe holpen will i send you forth and speed you with my store yea and moreover have ye will in this my land to bide this city that i build is yours here leave your ships to ride trojan and tyrian no two wise at hands of me shall fare and would indeed the self-same king himself aeneas with us were driven by that self-same southern gale but sure men will i send and bid them search through libya from end to utmost end lest cast forth anywhere he stray by town or forest part father aeneas thereupon high lifted up his heart nor stout achates less and both were fain the cloud to break and to aeneas first of all the leal achates spake o goddess born what thought hereof ariseth in thy mind all safe thou seest thy ships thy folk fair welcomed dost thou find one is away whom we ourselves saw sunken in the deep but all things else the promised word thy mother gave us keep lo even as he spake the word the cloud that wrapped them cleaves and in the open space of heaven no dusk behind it leaves and there aeneas stood and shone among the daylight clear with face and shoulders of a god for loveliness of hair his mother breathed upon her son and purple light of youth and joyful glory of the eyes e'en as in very sooth the hand gives ivory goodliness or when the parian stone or silver with the handicraft of yellow gold is done and therewithal unto the queen doth he begin to speak unlooked for of all men lo here the very man ye seek trojan aeneas caught away from libyan seas of late thou who alone of toils of troy hath been compassionate who takest us the leavings poor of danaean sword outworn with every hap of earth and sea of every good forlorn to city and to house of thine to thank thee for thy worth dido my might may compass not nay scattered o'er the earth the darden folk for what thou dost may never give thee need but if somewhere a godhead is the righteous man to heed if justice is or any soul to note the right it wrought may gods give thee due reward what joyful ages brought thy days to birth what mighty ones gave such a one to-day now while the rivers seaward run and while the shadows stray o'er hollow hills and while the pole the stars is pasturing wide still shall thine honour and thy name still shall thy praise abide what land soever calleth me therewith his right hand sought his very friend ilionis his left serestus caught and then the others gyrus strong Cloanthus strong in fight. Sidonian Dido marvelled much, first at the hero's sight, then marvelled at the haps he had, and so such word did say. O goddess born, what fate is this that ever dogs thy way with such great perils? What hath yoked thy life to this wild shore? And art thou that Aeneas then, whom holy Venus bore unto Anchises, Trojan lord, by Phrygian Simois wave? of teucer unto sidon come a memory yet i have who driven from out his fatherland was seeking new abode by belus help but belus then my father overrode cyprus the rich and held the same as very conquering lord so from that tide i knew of troy and bitter fate's award i knew of those pelasgian kings yea and i knew thy name he then a foeman added praise to swell the Teucrian fame, and oft was glad to deem himself of ancient Teucer's line. So hasten now to enter in neath roofs of me and mine, me too a fortune such as yours, me tossed by many a toil, hath pleased to give a biding place at last upon this soil. Learned in ill haps, full wise am I, unhappy men to aid. Such tale she told and therewith led to house full kingly maid aeneas bidding therewithal the gods with gifts to grace nor yet their fellows she forgat upon the sea-beat place but sendeth them a twenty bulls an hundred bristling backs of swine an hundred fatted lambs whereof his ewe none lacks and gifts and gladness of the god meanwhile the gleaming house within with kingly pomp is dight and in the midmost of the hall a banquet they prepare cloths labored o'er with handicraft and purple proud is there 
great is the silver on the board and carven out of gold the mighty deeds of father folk a long-drawn tale is told end of section 48 this recording is in the public domain Section 49 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Aeneas at the Court of Dido by Pierre Narcisse Guerin, France, 1774 to 1833. Painting, page 276. The scene here pictured is that in which Queen Dido bids Aeneas tell her the story of the fall of Troy and his seven years of wandering over land and sea. All are silent and gaze upon him eagerly. O oh, Queen, he said, you are bidding me revive sorrows that cannot be fully expressed. You bid me rehearse how the Greeks overwhelm the Trojan kingdom. I saw this, I was part of the conflict, but no Greek, not even one of the ferocious followers of Odysseus, could tell such a tale without tears. And yet, if you wish so earnestly to know my misfortune and the last struggle of Troy, then, even though I shudder to relate them and would fain escape the suffering, I will begin. From the terrace on which they sit may be seen the sea and the harbour of Carthage, its promontory crowned with a lighthouse, while in front is the temple of Neptune with a statue of the god bearing his trident. Dido reclines upon a couch, her arm about the young Ascanius, son of Aeneas. Her sister Anna leans upon the arm of the couch, and Aeneas begins his tale. End of section 49. This recording is in the public domain. Section 50 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090. California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Chapin. Section 50, The Cutting of the Aqueduct, by Gustav Flaubert. In 241 BC, the First Punic War came to an end, but Carthage was by no means free from her troubles. The greater part of her soldiers were barbarians, lured from distant lands by the promise of pay and of pillage. As her treasury was exhausted, she proposed to the troops that only a part of what was due them should be paid. Naturally, the mercenaries or hired soldiers rebelled. They chose Spendius and Matho for their commanders, and induced some of the native African tribes to join them. For a time Carthage was in extreme danger, and it was not until after three years of warfare that Himilcar succeeded in overpowering them. The Editor The Carthaginians rejoined their lines and entered the enormous gate that resoundingly reclosed behind them. It did not yield. The barbarians plunged and battered against it, and during the lapse of some minutes the entire length of the army presented an oscillation that became gentler and gentler, and at last entirely subsided. The Carthaginians, having stationed soldiers on the aqueduct, commenced hurling stones, balls, and beams. Spendius averred that it was useless to persist. Therefore they pitched their encampment at a greater distance from the walls, fully resolved to besiege Carthage. Meanwhile the rumor of the war had traveled beyond the confines of the Punic dominion, and from the pillars of Hercules, as far as the other side of Cyrene, the herdsmen guarding their herds dreamed of it and the caravans talked about it at night in the starlight. This grand Carthage, mistress of the sea, splendid as the sun, awful as a god, had found men who dared to attack her. Even her downfall had frequently been reported, 
and all had believed it probable as all were longing for it the subject peoples tributary villages allied provinces and independent tribes those who cursed her for her tyranny or who were jealous of her power or who coveted her wealth the bravest had very quickly joined themselves to the mercenaries the defeat at the makar however prevented all the others finally they regained confidence and gradually making advances had come nearer and now the inhabitants of the eastern regions had posted themselves in the sand hills of hypia on the other side of the gulf as soon as the barbarians appeared they showed themselves these were not the libyans from the environs of carthage who had for a long time constituted the third army but the nomads from the plateau of barca bandits of the cape of fiscus and the promontory of dern and those from Fazania and from marmarica they had crossed the desert sustaining themselves by drinking from the brackish wells built of camel's bones the zuasis covered with ostrich plumes had come in their quadrigia the garamantes masked with black veils riding far back on their painted mares others mounted on asses on onagers on zebras or on buffaloes and some dragged the roofs of their cabins shaped like a shallop with their families and idols there were also ammonians whose limbs were wrinkled by the hot water of the fountains the otrontes who cursed the sun the troglodytes who laughingly interred their dead under branches of trees and the hideous Ossians, who ate locusts, the Acrimacades, who ate lice, and the Gysantes, painted over with vermilion, and who ate monkeys, all were ranged on the sea coast in a great straight line. They advanced in succession, like whirlwinds of sand raised by the wind. In the middle of the isthmus, their crowd stopped. The mercenaries established before them near the walls did not wish to move. Then, from the direction of Ariana, appeared men from the west the people of numidia for in fact nar havas only governed the massilians and furthermore a custom permitting them after a reverse to abandon their king they had reassembled on the zanius then at their first movement hamilcar had made they had crossed it first were seen running all the hunters of the male that fall and of the garafos clothed in lions as skins and driving with the shafts of their spikes little thin horses with long manes following these came the getulians encased in breastplates made of serpents skin in the ferugians wearing tall crowns made of wax and resin these were followed by the conians macars and tillibears each holding two javelins and a round buckler of hippopotamus hide they halted at the base of the catacombs near the first pools of the lagoon but when the libyans had moved off on the ground that they had occupied there appeared like a cloud lying flat on the earth a multitude of negroes they had come from white harush and black harush from the desert of agula and even from the vast country of gazimba which was four months journey to the south of the garamantes and even more distant in spite of their redwood ornaments the filth on their black skins made them resemble mulberries that had been rolled a long time in the dust they wore breeches made from the fibres of bark tunics of dried grass and on their heads the muzzles of wild animals they howled like wolves shaking triangles ornamented with dangling rings and brandished cow-tails on the end of a pole by way of banners behind the nubidians the marusians and the gatulians thronged the yellow men who were scattered over the country beyond tagir in the cedar forest catskin quivers beat over their shoulders and they led in leashes enormous dogs as tall as asses which never barked in short as if africa had not sufficiently emptied itself and in order to gather up more furies they had even recruited the lowest races in the rear of all the others could be seen men with profiles of animals who laughed in an idiotic manner wretches ravaged by hideous diseases deformed pygmies mulattoes of doubtful sex albinos blinking their pink eyes in the sunlight all stammering unintelligible sounds and putting a finger in their mouths to signify their hunger the medley of weapons was not less confused than the people or their apparel not a deadly invention that could not be found here from wooden poignards stone battle-axes ivory tridents to long sabres toothed like saws slender and made of a pliable sheet of copper 
they wielded cutlasses divided in many branches like antelopes' horns they carried billhooks attached to cords iron triangles clubs and stilettos the ethiopians of bombotus hid in their hair tiny poisoned darts many had brought stones and sacks others who were empty-handed gnashed their teeth a continual surging swayed this multitude dromedaries daubed with tar like the hulls of ships upset the women who carried their children on their hips provisions were spilled out of their baskets and in walking one stepped on morsels of rock salt packages of gum rotten dates and guru nuts sometimes on a bosom alive with burman could be seen suspended from a fine cord a diamond a fabulous gem worth an entire empire which satraps had coveted the majority of these people did not know what they desired a fascination a curiosity impelled them the nomads who had never seen a city were frightened by the vast shadows cast by the massive walls now the isthmus was obscured by this multitude of men and the long span of tents resembling cabins during an inundation spread out to the first lines of the other barbarians who were streaming with metal and symmetrically established on the two flanks of the aqueduct the carthaginians were still in terror of those who had already arrived when they perceived coming straight towards the city like monsters and like edifices with their shafts weapons cordage articulations capitals and carapaces the engines sent for the siege by the tyrian cities sixty carabalistas eighty onjers thirty scorpions fifty tolentones twelve rams and three gigantic catapults with the capacity of throwing rocks weighing fifteen talents masses of men clutched at their base pushed pulled and toiled to propel the engines that quivered and shook at each step thus they came in front of the walls but it would still require many days to complete the preparations for the siege the mercenaries forewarned by their previous defeats did not wish to risk themselves in fruitless engagements and on neither one side nor the other was there any hurry as all knew that a terrible action was about to ensue which would result either in victory or complete extermination carthage could hold out for a long time her broad walls offered a series of salient and re-entering angles an arrangement full of advantages for repelling an assault however on the side of the catacombs a portion of the wall had crumbled and during obscure nights between the disjointed blocks could be seen the lights in the dens of malqua in certain places they overlooked the top of the ramparts and here lived those who had taken for new wives the women of the mercenaries chased by matho out of the camp when the women saw again their own people their hearts melted and they waved from afar long scarves then they came in the darkness to chat with the soldiers through the rift in the walls and the grand council was apprised one morning that they had all taken flight some had crawled between the stones others more intrepid had descended by ropes spendius finally resolved to accomplish his cherished project the war by keeping him at a distance had up to the present debarred him from it and since they had returned before carthage it seemed to him that the townsmen suspected his enterprise but soon they diminished the sentinels on the aqueduct as they did not possess too many guards for the defence of the ensante during many days the former slave practised aiming arrows at the flamingos standing on the lake shore then one evening when the moon shone bright he entreated matho to have lighted during the middle of the night a huge bonfire of straw and cause all his men simultaneously to utter shrieks then taking xarxus he went off by the shore of the gulf in the direction of tunis when abreast of the last arches they turned back going straight towards the aqueduct as the road was exposed they advanced creeping along up to the base of the pillars the sentinels on the platform patrolled tranquilly high flames darted up clarions were sounded the soldiers in the watch-towers believing that it was an assault rushed toward carthage one man remained he appeared as a black figure against the dome of the sky the moonlight was behind him and his disproportionate shadow fell afar on the plain like a moving obelisk they waited until he was exactly in front of them Xarxes seized his sling but spendius stayed him actuated by prudence 
or ferocity and whispered no the whirring of the ball will make a noise i will do it then he strung his bow with all his might and supporting the end against his left instep took aim and the fatal arrow flew the man did not fall he disappeared if he were wounded we should hear him said spendius and he sprang fleetly up story after story as he had done the first time by the aid of the harpoon and cord and when he reached the top beside the corpse he let the cord fall the balearian fastened to it a pick and mallet and returned the trumpets no longer sounded all had subsided into perfect quiet spendius had lifted one of the stones entered the water and replaced the stone over himself estimating the distance by paces he came exactly to the spot where he had previously noticed a slanting fissure and for three hours in fact till morning he worked in a continuous furious way breathing with great difficulty through the interstices of the superior stones assailed with violent pains twenty times he believed he was dying at last a cracking was heard an enormous stone bounded on the inferior arches and rolled down to the bottom and all at once a cataract an entire river of great volume fell as from the sky into the plain the aqueduct cut in the middle was emptying itself this was the death of carthage and the victory of the barbarians in an instant the carthaginians aroused in terror appeared on the walls the house tops and all the temples the barbarians gave vent to joyous shouts danced around the vast waterfall in delirium and in the extravagance of their delight wetted their heads in the rushing water at the summit of the aqueduct a man was perceived wearing a torn brown tunic leaning over the edge his hands upon his hips gazing beneath him to the very bottom as though astonished at his own work then he stood erect traversing the horizon with a proud impressive air which seemed to say behold this is all my work applause burst from the barbarians at last the carthaginians comprehended the cause of their disaster and howled in despair spendius ran from end to end of the platform distracted by pride raising his arms like the driver of a victorious chariot in the olympian games end of section fifty this recording is in the public domain section fifty one of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the world story volume 3 egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section 51 the fall of carthage by rev alfred j church 146 bc according to legend carthage was founded by queen dido in the ninth century bc the city prospered and by the middle of the fourth century before christ the carthaginians ruled the northern coast of africa from the pillars of hercules or the straits of gibraltar to what is now tripoli their commercial settlements stretched along this whole coast but their special domain was that part of the shore which is nearest sicily here were numerous towns and also their capital city for many years the romans had been jealous of the rising greatness of carthage and in 264 B.C. war broke out between the two countries. After more than a century of warfare, broken twice by some years of peace, Carthage was utterly destroyed. The Editor The actual fortifications of the upper city did not offer any serious resistance to the assailants. They were of extreme antiquity and were not only greatly decayed, but were inadequate to meet, even had they been in the best condition, the improved methods of attack which had been introduced since the time of their erection. Some attempt had been made to put them into repair within the last few months, but to very little purpose. Nothing short of a complete reconstruction would have been of any practical use. The Roman battering rams had not been at work for a day before it became evident that several breaches would speedily be made in the walls. In fact, so many weak spots had been revealed that even the most determined and powerful garrison could not have hoped to make them all good in the course of the night the whole line was evacuated still carthage was not to be taken without a desperate struggle twice already had her mother city tyre defended herself with fury against assailants of overwhelming strength footnote against nebuchadnezzar in five ninety eight b c 
and against Alexander in 331. End footnote. And the world was to see a still more terrible scene of rage and madness some two centuries later, when the Hebrew people defended its last stronghold, Jerusalem, against the legions of Rome. The Carthaginians were now to show themselves not unworthy of these famous kinsfolk. The upper city was penetrated by three streets, all of them built on steep inclines and converging on the summit of the hill. On this the citadel stood, itself crowned by the famous temple of Esculapius. This was built on a rock, three sides of which displayed a sheer descent of some sixty feet, while the fourth was ascended by a long flight of steps. The three streets were built to suit the oriental taste, perhaps we should rather say the oriental need, which prefers shade to the circulation of air and light. They were so narrow that the inhabitants of opposite houses, the houses commonly inclined outward, could almost shake hands from their windows. The houses were not of equal height, but they were all lofty, sometimes having as many as seven or eight stories. At the back of these main thoroughfares was a wilderness of lanes and alleys, consisting for the most part of smaller houses, with now and then a paved yard or small garden. Up these streets the Romans had to force their way. Almost every house was a fortress which had to be separately attacked and separately taken. The first danger that had to be encountered was a shower of tiles and bricks from the roofs and upper stories. These missiles, heavy themselves and falling with tremendous force from the lofty buildings, would have been terribly destructive, had not the assailants protected themselves by the formation of the testudo, or tortoise. This was made by the men ranging their shields over their heads in a close impenetrable array, under cover of which they broke down the doors of house after house. Sometimes even the testudo reeled under the shock of some more than usually heavy mass. More than once it was actually broken when the defending party contrived to detach and send down upon it the whole of a parapet. Whenever this happened, no small loss of life was the result. When an entrance had been forced into the house, every story became the scene of a fresh conflict. Driven at last to the roof, the defenders would sometimes prefer to hurl themselves down to the street below, rather than fall into the hands of the enemy. Some would take a desperate leap across the space that separated them from the houses opposite. Others crossed on bridges of planks or doors which they hastily made, or in some cases had prepared in anticipation. It is needless to say that a conflict of such a kind was fought with the greatest ferocity. It was a struggle for the most part between a people and an army. The inhabitants, seldom if ever protected by armor, and furnished with the weapons that chance supplied, often indeed reduced to nothing more effective than sticks or household implements, fought desperately against well-protected, well-armed, well-disciplined men. The women were even more frenzied than the men. Driven to bay, they flew like wildcats at the Romans, and bit and scratched till they were slain or disabled. There was no question of quarter. It was not even asked. The assailants, as they slowly advanced, winning their way yard by yard, left a lifeless desolation behind them, with the dead lying as they had fallen, on every staircase, and in every chamber. This battle of the streets lasted with unabated fury for six days. The besiegers, of course, fought in relays. There were three detachments, and each had its regular time of service, four hours twice in the day, for, of course, no cessation of the attack was possible. One man allowed himself no rest, and this one man was Scipio. During the whole of the six days he never slept, or at least never composed himself to sleep, for nature would sometimes assert itself untiring as was the spirit which dominated his physical frame and he could not help a brief slumber as he sat at his meals. These he took as chance gave him the opportunity. They were hurried repasts of the simplest kind, a piece of dried flesh, a crust of bread or a biscuit, with now and then a bunch of raisins. His drink was rigidly limited to water, for in battle he always acted on the principle which made Hector refuse the wine-cup which his mother proffered him in an interval of battle. Footnote. Far hence be Bacchus' gifts, the chief rejoined. Inflaming wine, pernicious to mankind, unnerves the limbs, and dulls the noble mind. Iliad. Pope. 6. In footnote. At sunset on the sixth day the upper city was practically held by the Romans. Nothing but the citadel remained to be taken, 
and that was so arduous an undertaking that the attack was necessarily postponed till the troops had had some rest. But the spirit of the Carthaginians was at last broken. Just as the troops told off for the first assault had finished mustering, and before the trumpets had sounded the signal for the advance, a procession, headed by a herald who carried a flag of truce in his hand, was seen to be descending the steps that led from the temple of Esculapius. Lost to sight for a short time as it came under cover of the outer wall of the citadel, it next became visible as it issued from one of the gates. Scipio, who was about to address his troops, went forward to meet the newcomers. Their leader, whose style and title were given by the herald as chief priest of the temple of Esculapius, addressed him, his words being interpreted by a Roman prisoner. Leader of the armies of Rome, so ran the speech, the gods have given thy country the final victory over her rival. Four centuries ago Rome felt it to be an honor to be acknowledged by Carthage as an ally on equal terms. Footnote. A treaty was made between Rome and Carthage in the year 509 B.C. End footnote. Since then there has been continued rivalry and frequent war between the two nations. More than once it has seemed likely that the fates had decreed that the seat of empire should be in Africa rather than in Italy. But this was not their will. We have long been convinced that we were not to rule. Now we perceive that we are not even to be permitted to exist. But though it is necessary for the honor, if not for the safety of Rome, that Carthage should be destroyed, it is not necessary that a multitude of innocent persons whose sole offense is to have been born within the walls of a doomed city should also perish. There are some, a few thousands out of many, who have, it is true, committed the offense of defending their country. These also implore your mercy. That they can resist your attack they acknowledge to be impossible. But they can at least claim this merit, that by a prompt surrender they will save the lives of some of your soldiers. Your nation, man of Rome, has been ready beyond all others to show mercy to the conquered. And your family, Scipio, has been conspicuous in this as in all other virtues. Be worthy, we beseech you, of your country, your house, and yourself. It was without a moment's hesitation that Scipio replied to this harangue, nor had he to use the services of an interpreter. With that indefatigable energy which distinguished him, he had employed the scanty leisure allowed by his duties to learn the Carthaginian language, of which at the beginning of the siege he had been as ignorant as were the rest of his countrymen. I will not use many words, for time presses and there is much to be done. The multitude of unarmed persons may come forth without fear. Their lives are assured to them. Nor do we bear any enmity against brave men who have fought against us. They shall not be harmed. I accept only from my offer of mercy those who have betrayed their country by deserting it. The answer had scarcely been spoken before a huge multitude to whom its purport had probably been communicated by some preconcerted signal poured out from the gates. Seldom has a more piteous sight been seen. With faces wan with famine, and clothed for the most part in squalid rags, the long lines of old men, women, and children defiled before the Roman general as he stood surrounded by his staff. True to his gentle and kindly nature, he busied himself in making provision for their immediate wants. The whole number, there were fifty thousand in all, a great crowd, it is true, but pitiably small in comparison with the supposed total of non-combatants, when the siege began, was divided into companies, each of which was assigned to the commissariat department of one or other of the legions. At the same time instructions were given to the officers in charge of the stores that their immediate necessities, and many of them were actually starving, should be relieved. The non-combatants thus disposed of, the soldiers that had surrendered followed. There may have been some six thousand in all, of whom five-sixths were mercenaries, one-sixth only native Carthaginians. They were in much better case than the rest of the population. In fact, as far as provisions were concerned, they had not been subjected to any hardship. The mercenaries had, for the most part, an indifferent look. It was depressing, doubtless, to have been serving for now three years an unsuccessful master, and to have missed the good pay which they might have earned elsewhere. But this was one of the chances of their profession, and they might hope to recoup themselves for their loss by another and more fortunate speculation. The Carthaginian minority were in a different temper. There was no future for them. Their country was gone, 
and if the love of life which asserts itself even over the fiercest and bitterest pride had bent their haughty temper to supplicate for mercy it could do nothing more each man as he passed in front of the general laid down his arms upon the ground these again were piled in heaps to be carried off in due time to the stores in the roman camp this business was just completed when a solitary figure was seen to issue from one of the gates in the citadel walls and hurriedly to approach the roman lines as he ran he was struck by a missile from the walls the blow leveled him to the ground but he regained his feet in the course of one or two minutes and hastened on though with a somewhat limping gait it was observed that he was dressed as a slave and as he came nearer that his face was so closely muffled that his features could not be recognized nevertheless his figure which was short and corpulent seemed to many to be familiar reaching the roman lines he threw himself at scipio's feet caught him by the knees and in broken greek begged for his life the general stretching forth his hand raised him from the ground it was hasdrubal the commander-in-chief of the armies of carthage a murmur of disgust at his poltroonery ran through the ranks here and there the kinsmen or comrades of the unhappy prisoners whom he had done to death in so barbarous a fashion a few months before gave vent to more menacing expressions of anger scipio silenced these manifestations of feeling by an imperative gesture of command your life is spared he said see that you make a due return for the boon it must not be supposed that the roman general was disposed to regard with any kind of leniency asdrubal's baseness and barbarity it was from policy that he spared the miserable creature's life in the first place it was the custom from which it would be injudicious to depart to make the king or chief general of a conquered people an essential part of the triumph which would celebrate the victory secondly he was aware that the prisoner would be useful in many ways that there were important matters about which he could give the best or it might be the only available information as to the boon of life it seemed to his own noble nature to be a very small thing indeed for himself he felt that had such a situation been possible he would far sooner have died than survive to face such shame and ignominy the craven clinging to life which dominates such mean natures as asdrubal's was simply incomprehensible to scipio but if he despised asdrubal while he spared him there were others among the carthaginian leaders for whom he felt a genuine admiration and respect and to whom he was willing to offer honorable terms of surrender where he asked hasdrubal are your colleagues in command and the chief magistrates they are in the temple of asculapius replied the carthaginian think you that they will be willing to surrender they are brave men and have done their best and they shall be honorably treated i know not what they intend muttered the fugitive with as much shame as it was in his nature to feel i will at least try them said scipio and he advanced towards the citadel followed by some of his staff hasdrubal much against his will was constrained to accompany them a number of figures could be seen on the roof of the temple which as has been explained formed the summit of the citadel as soon as he came within earshot of the place he bade one of the prisoners step forward and communicate his ultimatum to what may be called the garrison of the temple scipio offers to all free-born carthaginian citizens life on honorable terms to all those who have deserted he promises a fair trial so that if they can show any just cause for having left their country even they may not despair of safety to this appeal no answer was made after a while as scipio and his attendants waited for reply thin curls of smoke were seen to rise from the temple next a woman leading a young boy by either hand approached the edge of the roof she was clothed in a flowing robe of crimson confined at the waist by a broad golden girdle her long hair which streamed far below her waist was bound round her temples by a circlet of diamonds that flashed splendidly in the sun by baal cried the carthaginian prisoner who delivered scipio's message it is the lady salamo herself who is it say you asked scipio the lady salamo answered the man the wife of my lord the general it was indeed the wife of hasdrubal man of rome she began in a clear penetrating voice which made itself heard far and wide addressing herself to scipio who was conspicuous in the scarlet cloak worn by generals commanding armies man of rome to thee there comes no blame from gods or men 
Carthage was the enemy of your country, and thou hast conquered it. But on this Hasdrubal, this traitor who hath been false to his fatherland, to his gods, to me whose shame it is to have been his wife, and to his children, may the gods of Carthage wreak their vengeance. And thou, Scipio, I charge thee, fail not to be their instrument. She then turned to Hasdrubal. Villain, she cried, and liar, and coward. As for me and these children, we shall find a fit burial in this fire. And as she spoke, a great flame sprung up for a moment among the gathering clouds of smoke. But thou, that wast the chiefest man in Carthage, what dishonorable grave wilt thou find? This only I know, that neither thy children nor I will live to see thy disgrace. Turning from the wretched man with a gesture of contempt, she drew a dagger from her girdle and plunged it into the heart first of one, and then of the other of the two children who stood at her side. Then flinging the bloody weapon from her, she leaped into the midst of the flames by which this time were rapidly gaining the mastery over the whole building. All her companions shared her fate. The Carthaginian nobles were too proud to live under the sway of Rome. The deserters were conscious of their guilt, or distrusted the justice of a Roman tribunal. Anyhow, not a single individual out of the desperate band to which Scipio had addressed his appeal availed himself of the opportunity. End of section 51 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philip Gould Section 52 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org Northern Africa, Part 2. Life and Customs in Northern Africa. Historical Note. Christianity was promptly introduced into Northern Africa, and for some years the country was a stronghold of the Church. Tertullian, Cyprian, and Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, were among the Christian leaders of those centuries. Here, too, it was that the first translation of the Bible into Latin was made. In the seventh century, however, the Mohammedans overran the land, and in less than a hundred years they had made converts of the greater part of the native tribes. Early in the eighth century, the Moors crossed from Africa into Spain and soon conquered that country. When finally driven out, they withdrew to northern Africa and took up the business of piracy, first in revenge against the Christians, but later as a lucrative profession. Vessels passing through the Mediterranean Sea were in imminent danger of being seized and having their crews held for ransom in most revolting slavery. It had become the custom to pay tribute or redemption money, and this the United States was forced to do for some years for lack of a navy. In 1815, however, a navy had been prepared. Decatur was sent against the day, and soon brought him to terms and put an end to the piracy. During the 19th century and the early part of the 20th, control of Algeria and Tunis was gradually assumed by France, and a protectorship over Morocco jointly established by France and Spain. Tripoli was a vilayet, or province of the Ottoman Empire, until 1911, when it was seized by Italy. End of section 52. This recording is in the public domain. Section 53 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Scott, Cheltenham, England. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 53, How the Barbary Pirates Learned to Respect the American Flag, 1815, by John Back McMaster. During 17 years, the United States had been paying an annual tribute to the day, but as the Moors computed time by the moon, while all Christian people reckoned it by the sun, the Moorish year was the shorter and this difference in the course of the seventeen years amounted to some six months in favour of the day. 
according to his mode of measuring time he was therefore entitled to twenty seven thousand dollars more than he had received and for this sum a demand was made and instantly complied with by mr tobias lear the american consul it now became necessary to find a new cause of complaint which the day accordingly did the stores he said sent by the united states in place of money were bad in quality and notified mr lear to depart at once the consul might possibly have quieted the day even at this point but unhappily two ships loaded with cables and anchors powder and shot and naval stores a present from great britain reached algiers and the day sent forth his corsairs armed and equipped by england to prey on american commerce in the mediterranean there was little to be destroyed yet they made prize of the brig edwin of salem sold the crew of ten men into slavery and dragged an american citizen from the deck of a spanish vessel while the war with england lasted these outrages had to be endured but five days after peace was proclaimed madison asked that war be declared against algiers congress willingly complied and two fine squadrons in charge of two gallant seamen were soon assembled at boston and new york captain william bainbridge commanded that in the port of boston captain stephen decatur commanded the fleet at new york he was first to get under way and with ten vessels mounting two hundred and ten guns put to sea on may twenty a short run across the atlantic by way of the azores brought the squadron off the coast of portugal where a sharp lookout was kept for the enemy the foe was indeed not to be despised for the algerine fleet consisted of five frigates six sloops of war and a schooner carrying all told three hundred and sixty guns the crews were well drilled and thoroughly trained the vessels were well equipped with every appliance of modern naval warfare and what was quite as important were commanded by rais hamida the terror of the mediterranean though every ship fell in with was spoken nothing was heard of the enemy till june fifteen when tangier was reached and decatur learned from the american consul that the algerian admiral had passed the straits two days before in the forty-six gun frigate mashuda not a moment was lost in giving chase and that same day the fleet anchored off gibraltar where decatur was told that the vessels he sought were to be found off cape gatta as one dispatch boat had been detected making for the cape to notify rais Amida of the presence of the american squadron and another had been seen making all sail toward algiers decatur again weighed anchor without loss of time and standing up the mediterranean before a good breeze sighted the mashuda in the early dawn of june seventeen she was lying too off the coast and as everything about her showed that her commander had no suspicion of the character of the squadron decatur gave the order do nothing to excite suspicion and bore steadily down upon her but the order was misunderstood by the officers on the constellation who when about a mile from the enemy hoisted the american flag every other ship instantly displayed the english colours but the moor was not deceived and crowding on all sail he made for algiers till the constellation which happened to be the nearest opened fire at long range and placed several of her shot upon his deck when he came about and headed for cartagena decatur in the guerriere then bore down to close with him and reserving fire till his ship just cleared the yard arms of the mashuda he poured in two broadsides in quick succession the slaughter was dreadful rais Amida was killed and the deck covered with dead and wounded yet the moors would not surrender but putting up the helm made every effort to escape in doing so they crossed the path of the gun brig Apervier, which though vastly inferior in size and armament fired broadside after broadside till the mashuda struck her flag she was sent to cartagena while the fleet sailed on in search of the remainder of the algerian squadron supposed to be near at hand no enemy was seen however till june nineteen when a sail was descried not far from cape palos and chased a hard run of three hours duration brought the stranger into water so shallow that none but the torch the spark the spitfire and the epivier could follow and as these kept in hot pursuit 
the moors ran their brig aground and took to their boats the prize which was floated off and sent to cartagena proved to be the estido of twenty-two guns and a crew of one hundred and eighty men of whom eighty-three were taken prisoners as enough had now been done to make the day listen to reason decatur led his squadron toward africa and on the twenty eighth of june sighted the glittering pile of houses which formed the city of algiers by the little fleet which approached it the place would have seemed to an onlooker to be impregnable the artificial mole which made the harbour bristled with two hundred and twenty heavy guns almost three hundred more were mounted on a wall of immense thickness which surrounded the city decatur however paid no attention to the dangers of the task he had to perform but marched boldly in with a white flag at the foremast and a swedish flag at the main and in a few hours had the swedish consul and the captain of the port on board where said decatur addressing the algerian is your squadron by this time was the answer it is safe in some neutral port not at all was the reply for we have captured the mashuda and the estido at first the captain of the port would not believe it but when the lieutenant of the mashuda stepped forward and confirmed the news he asked what were the terms of peace and proposed that those charged with the duty of concluding it should land and begin negotiations his purpose was so plainly to gain time that decatur stoutly declared that peace must be made on the deck of the guerriere or not at all and the moor went back to consult his master next day he returned with full powers to negotiate and was informed of the terms the day must renounce all claims to future tribute must set free all american prisoners without ransom must repay in money the value of the goods and property taken from them must pay ten thousand dollars to the owners of the edwin and guarantee that the commerce of the united states should never again be molested by algerian corsairs the agent of the day protested that the terms were too hard declared that it was the late day haji ali and not his master omar pasha who began the war and claimed now that haji ali was dead that omar was not to blame his protests and his arguments were of no avail and finding that decatur would abate nothing he asked for three hours delay not a minute said decatur not a minute and the captain of the port hurried ashore with the understanding that if the day accepted the terms he would return with a white flag in his boat when he had been gone about an hour an algerian ship of war loaded with turkish soldiers was seen approaching the harbour at the sight of the ship the guerriere was cleared for action and was on the point of getting under way when the boat of the captain of the port was described coming rapidly toward the guerriere with a white flag in her bow and in a few minutes the treaty and the ten liberated prisoners doomed to a yet more terrible fate were on board with as little delay as possible the men rejoicing in their new-found liberty were transferred to the epervier which with a copy of the treaty sailed for the united states lieutenant john templer shubrick was in command and on july twelfth passed the straits of gibraltar never to be seen again the british west indian fleet reported having seen a brig of her description during a very heavy gale in which it is believed she foundered but when and how she met her fate is still a mystery after the departure of the epervier decatur sailed for tunis and dropped anchor before the town on july twenty six during the war the american privateer abellino had sent prizes into tunis a neutral port but the bay had suffered the british cruiser lion to retake them and for this decatur demanded the payment of forty six thousand dollars within twelve hours the terms were accepted the money was paid and decatur went on to tripoli which he reached on august five tripoli had doubly offended the bashaw had suffered the british cruiser paulina to take out two prizes sent in by the abellino and had forced the american consul to lower his flag decatur therefore demanded thirty thousand dollars for the lost prizes and a salute of thirty-one guns to the flag the bashaw blustered refused gathered an army of twenty thousand men manned the batteries and threatened to declare war but when he saw decatur taking soundings he recalled the bombardment of eighteen o four and made peace 
the money indemnity was reduced to twenty five thousand dollars and in consideration of this the bashaw released ten christians held as slaves two were danes and the others sicilians as all differences with the barbary powers now seemed honourably settled decatur repaired to gibraltar and joined the squadron under bainbridge lest the withdrawal of all the ships should be followed by a renewal of the war while the day the bay and the bashaw were still smarting under their punishment the squadron was divided part returned with bainbridge and decatur to the united states part wintered at port Mahon. the precaution proved to be a wise one during the winter and early spring of eighteen sixteen the day of algiers saw many reasons for disliking the treaty flatterers and agents of all sorts were very busy persuading him that it was disgraceful to so humble himself before christian dogs the brig Estido, which decatur had promised should be returned to him and which was actually delivered to his officers had been seized by the spanish authorities as a ship captured within their waters and for this the day blamed the united states but more than all was the treaty made with lord exmouth by which great britain was forced to pay four hundred thousand dollars for the liberation of twelve thousand neapolitans and sardinians held in captivity decatur had secured the release of captives without paying a dollar when therefore the squadron left port Mahon in april and anchored off the mole at algiers and the american consul presented the treaty duly ratified by the senate it was returned by the vizier with such insolence that the consul hauled down his flag and took up his abode on the java captain john shaw who commanded the fleet instantly put his ships in position to bombard the mole arranging his boats in two flotillas to attack the land and water batteries selected the night for the attack and was about to move when the commander of a french frigate discovered his preparations and sent word to the day who at once submitted a visit to the bay of tunis ended the naval operations on the mediterranean and in october all the ships save four sailed for home the task was thoroughly done at last our flag was respected not merely by the barbary powers but by the nations whose dominions lay along the north shore of the mediterranean sea end of section fifty three this recording is in the public domain